Well, good morning. Let's stand as we sing our first worship song this morning.
stand in your presence this morning and bask in the love of the Savior who gave his life for us. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you would draw us close. We pray that you would have your time, uh, have your way in our lives, and that you would uh, you would receive our, our worship this morning as a blessing. Lord, we're thankful, and we remember the way your son taught us to pray, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, actually, before you're seated, let's do the, the scripture reading. It's always nice to be stand for uh, the word of God. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 6, and verses 16 through 22. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. He bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of peoples set him free. He made his master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased, and teach his elders wisdom. Amen. You may be seated now. Um, just a, a couple of announcements. Um, you can find a lot of information on our church website. You can give offering on our church website. Uh, you can find out find things we find in the bulletin on the church website and um, there's some other things on there as well. Uh, I want to mention again that August 30th we'll be engaging in a day of prayer, uh, prayer for our communities. And the day will begin with our morning worship service and then uh, after the service from 12 to 6 we'll be engaging in prayer in three different ways. Um, one is we will have the sanctuary open so that people can come in and spend some time in quiet prayer. Uh, two, we'll have people in the parking lot so people can drive up and share a prayer request with, with one of us and uh, we can pray for them. And then the third thing is we'll have somebody monitoring our church Facebook page uh, throughout the afternoon so that uh, we can pray for any prayer requests we receive 
either in the comments or through a private message. But, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. It's good to, uh, to lift one another up, to lift our community up. Uh, and as we speak of prayer, and we'll be going to prayer in a few minutes after a couple more psalms, is there anyone that has a, a prayer request or a praise they haven't had a chance to share with me yet this morning? Let's sing a couple more songs then, and we will have a, a time of prayer right after. Let's play that next song.
Lord God, we give you praise this morning. Lord, we come and we, uh, we're so thankful that we can come to you and we can share our requests. Because Lord, the truth is, life is bigger than we can successfully handle on our own, Lord. You know by successfully, I just mean living in a way that honors you, following a path that leads to you. And so, Lord, we come and we, we confess our need for you. Confess our need for a Savior, Lord. Confess our need for you to be at work in our lives, Lord, and at work in the lives of our loved ones, Lord. Lord, there are, there are some on our minds this morning that we lift up to you. Lord, we, uh, we pray for Eric, Nora and Eric, Lord. We ask that you would provide for them, Lord. You know exactly what they need, and I pray that you would meet their needs. And, and Lord, uh, we pray that you would meet it soon. Lord, we lift up Robbie this morning. We pray that you'd continue to take care of his servant. We pray that you would uh, give him exactly what he needs for you know this, you know his situation. Lord, we, uh, we pray for, for Cheryl and Debbie, Lord, as they recover from, uh, from some serious illness, Lord. Would you take care of them? Would you help give them a speedy recovery and a full recovery, Lord? Would you encourage them? Lord, uh, as we think of encouragement, the truth is this world is full of people who need hope, who need encouragement from you. And Lord, often it's, we're in that group. Lord, there are challenges in the week that we've just finished, Lord. Things that were beyond our strength, beyond our uh, understanding. And yet, Lord, they are not beyond you. And Lord, as we have leaned on you, you have carried us through. And Lord, there will be challenges this week in this week ahead of us. Help us to, to meet them, not in our own strength, but in yours. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to not hold on to worries, Lord, but to surrender our worries as prayers to you, the, the Lord who can, who can answer them. Lord, we, uh, we pray for our community. We pray for, for our state and our nation, Lord. Lord, the, the last few months have been a trying time really for the whole world. And so, Lord, we, we seek your help. We pray that you would intervene, that you would bring, uh, bring a cure for the, for the illness that's spreading around, Lord. We pray that you would uh, help us to see that you are the cure for all the other ills that we are struggling with. And Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would be so at work in the life of your people, Lord. That, that we would just be your people, that we would live as your people, people of truth, people of hope, and that we would be able to share that with those around us, Lord, for we know who you are. We know what you've done, and we know of your love for us. And so we give you thanks for that, Lord. Lord, sometimes it's not easy, even for your people, but the challenge is all along us. We'd like to think that as we walk through this world that following you means everything will be just perfect. And yet, we know that's not true, Lord. Your love for us is perfect. Your provision for, for our salvation is perfect. And yet, we still walk through this broken world. But Lord, you've called us to be a, a beacon of light, to be, a, to be salt upon the earth, Lord, that would that would draw it to you. You've given us, Lord, your, your people a, a mission, Lord. All those years ago when you told your disciples to go and go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I had command, commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when you gave them that commission, Lord, it was a commission for us, us as well. We're still working on that commission today. We're still trying to to be your people in this world, Lord. Help us to not do that on our own, but to lean on you. We pray that for our own little corner of your kingdom, and we pray for that 
that for your church at large in this world, Lord. We pray that you would have your way in our lives and that your spirit would be contagious and that you would be glorified in your people. Help each one of us, Lord, as we seek to be a part of that. And we will give you praise and we will give you thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, amen. Yesterday I was I was talking with some family about the beauty of this area, about the beauty of Sebago Lake and the whole area in general. And uh, I was thinking about uh, some past hikes I've taken in the area. If you climb to the top of Douglas Mountain, you get this amazing view of the whole lake. If you're down on the shore of Sebago Lake, you can see a lot of it. But if you go up onto Douglas Mountain, you can see the whole thing. And you can look to the side and you can see uh, Long Lake over there. And if you turn and you look back on a clear day, you can see Mount Washington in, in all its beauty. And uh, the lake in the mountain seems so small off in the distance. And yet we know the lake is large. And we know that that Mount Washington is one of the, the top, it's the tallest mountain in the Northeast. And yet when you look at them from a distance, they seem so small. From a distance we can see so much and yet so little. From that view, you can't see all the people sitting in their homes and camps along the way. You can't see the people driving up the auto road on the mountain. You can't see the thousands of people living between the lake and the mountain. You can't see somebody in that area who's bringing home a newborn baby for the first time. You can't see the someone in that area who is near the end of life and on their way to the hospital. This world, even in our little corner of it, is full of tragedy and triumph. In this life, we experience beauty and brokenness. There's so much more to this world than what we can see or understand from our view. This morning, we'll be looking at the last part of uh, this, ser this series on Job, looking at the book of Job. Job experienced joy. And Job, experienced, and Job experienced suffering. And yet he had confidence in God's righteousness. And yet there was a whole bunch of things he didn't understand. The ultimate question Job had to ask himself, and the question we have to ask ourselves, is really quite simple. Do I trust God? That's the big question. Do I trust God? As I mentioned when we started this series a few weeks ago, Job is an uncomfortable book to read. It looks at the topic of suffering and brings up the age-old questions of why do people suffer? And rather than give us a firm answer, we're invited to take our eyes off of our present circumstances and put them on God who is our only hope for redemption. The book of Job invites us to trust in God's righteousness, regardless of our limited understanding. And although Job was written long before the birth of Christ, we also know something Job didn't. We know that at just the right time in, his, in the history of the world, God would send a redeemer who would take away the sins of the world and offer eternal life, not just to a few people, but to whosoever would put their faith in him. As we read through the book of Job, 
Uh, we see Job's times of frustration and discouragement, and we see his ongoing hope that God would someday confirm, that God would someday redeem him, that God would someday confirm that he didn't, he didn't deserve the suffering that he was experiencing. Through it all, Job never loses hope that even if he dies from his ordeal, he will find redemption in God's righteousness. He doesn't understand it all, but he trusts God. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Job 42. And we'll read the end of the book of Job. Job 42, beginning with verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to, to Eliphaz the, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite Bilhadad the Shuite, Zophar the Namathite, did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job and his after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him at his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the later part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named uh, Jemima, the second uh, Keziah, and the third uh, Karen Hapo. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so, Job died an old man and full of years. The end. I added the end, but almost sounds like a fairy tale as you read the ending of that. He died an old man full of years. In verse 3, Job acknowledges a, pro a problem that many of us are guilty of at times. Job confesses, he says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I was thinking about that this week, and it came to my mind that sometimes we spend too much time talking about God and not enough time talking with God. You know, it's fun. We can debate the mysteries of the universe. We can talk theology and try to figure out what, how and why God does what he does. But in the end, it always comes back to one question. 
We won't understand it all, but the question is this, do I trust him? Do I trust God and seek him? Think of it this way. If you left your spouse at home and you spent the next five years traveling the world, and you didn't call your spouse on the phone, you didn't write to them, you just left home and you spent the next uh, five years traveling the world. And your purpose, the thing you did throughout all your travels, was tell everyone how wonderful your spouse is. At the end of those five years, where, where would your marriage be? How well would you know your spouse if, even though you spent five years telling the world how great they are, if you didn't actually spend time with them yourself? It's not enough to talk about God. We need to talk with God. We need to walk with God, being obedient in what he desires for us. God hasn't revealed to us all the mysteries of the universe, but he has revealed to us what we need to know to live in a relationship with him, a right relationship with him, made possible to us by the sacrifice of Christ. Job and his friends had engaged in all these conversations about God in suffering and Job's guilt or innocence. But they, they never solved those mysteries. The real question for Job was not just why did these things happen, but will I continue to trust God in spite of these things? Throughout the whole book, Job seems to drift back and forth between his discouragement and his hope. Back in chapter 19, Job had declared, My Redeemer lives, and in the end I will see him with my own eyes. Now here at the end of the book, he's put his money where his mouth is. He already has to put his money where his mouth is. Will he indeed trust his Redeemer? Will he trust him even in the midst of his unexplained suffering? That's the uncomfortable thing about the book that I alluded to. Job and his friends bring up these questions of suffering, and Job declares his innocence. He hasn't done anything to deserve this. His friends try to tell him, surely he must have committed some great sin to anger God. At times, even Job acknowledges God must be angry with him. And finally, Job, God comes and reveals himself to, God, to Job. God speaks to Job from, from a whirlwind, from a storm. And God says a lot of things, but the one thing he doesn't explain to Job is why this all happened. He simply invites Job to remember who he is and invites Job to trust him. Job and his friends had engaged in all these conversations about God and suffering and Job's guilt or innocence, but they never solved the mystery of why. The real question for Job was not just why did these things happen, but will I continue to trust God? Will he trust him even in the midst of suffering? For Job, the answer was yes. Job confesses that there are things simply beyond his understanding. But now he has heard God and in fact has seen him in the midst of the storm. There's many things in this world you and I will never figure out. But the challenge of life in this fallen world isn't to figure it all out. It's to trust God who has revealed himself to us in Christ. And we have that privilege of hindsight. We live in the future. We have seen uh, God's ultimate revelation of who he is in the coming of Christ Jesus. Jesus who laid down his life to take away the sins of the world. It's been revealed to us that we can find restoration and a right relationship with God in Jesus. And so when we, we hear that, that great question, will we trust him? Will I trust him? Will I trust God? We have a, there is a face on that God. 
We know God a little bit better because we have seen who he is in Jesus. We have that huge advantage over Job. Job trusted God without seeing how his redemption would come. We know our Redeemer. We know his name is Jesus. And we know that he has said to all of us, come follow me. As for Job, his relationship with God was restored. We kind of get a happy ending in this story. Job was confronted by God and he repents in humility. Well, what did Job repent of? It was stated a few times that Job had committed no sin to, to deserve this. So what did Job repent of? Job repented of his lack of faith. He realized he needed to trust God. I think Job recognized that his faith, his trust in God, had been insufficient. It wasn't enough. It reminds me of chapter 9 in the Gospel of Mark. A man brings his son to Jesus to be healed, and he says to Jesus, If you can do anything, Take pity on us. And Jesus responds by saying, if I can, everything is possible for one who believes. The man then said to Jesus, I believe, now help my unbelief. I think that's how Job felt. I believe, now help my unbelief. You see, faith is a faith that trust in God is a gift from God. And you can never have enough of it. I believe, now help my unbelief. I trust, now help me to trust more. Faith isn't like storing money in a bank that you can be sure will still be there tomorrow. Faith is a daily reaffirmation of God's work in our lives. For us, faith is a daily renewal of our trust in Jesus. Jesus has died for my sins. Jesus has forgiven my sins. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, can cleanse my heart and empower me to live this life as he has called me to live. To trust that just as Jesus was resurrected from the grave, so I can be reborn as a child of God. That because of who he is, I can be an ambassador for his kingdom. His kingdom, which is birthing, bursting forth into this world. Job came to a place where his trust in God was not dependent on his circumstances. His trust in God was unconditional and based on who God is rather than what God had given him. For Job, his story ends like a fairy tale with the he lived happily ever after. But the truth is for many people, they're, they're happily ever after will not come during this earthly lifetime. But for the one who puts their trust in Christ, there will be a happily ever after. Not in earthly treasures that are temporary, but in eternal riches in the kingdom of heaven. Job's not the only one in this story who finds restoration. There are several... Uh, Job's friends find restoration as well, and there are several notable things about this. And I love that fact. Job's not the one who finds restoration. His friends find restoration even despite all the wrong things they had said about Job and God and his situation. But here's the thing we can learn from this, from this scripture. It was God who did the restoring. Job didn't restore himself. Job's friends didn't restore themselves. It wasn't their action that ultimately uh, restored them in their relationship with God. God did the restoring. They couldn't be restored on their own. Another thing, though, is that God required something of them. The men had to take action on their part. God leads the way in restoration. God does the restoring. 
but he requires us to cooperate with him. He quite requires of us to repent. The men had to take action on their part. God offered them grace, but they had to respond. They had to go and make the sacrifice that God had required of them. They had to go and ask Job, whom they had wronged, to pray for them. Something was required. The redemption cost them something. Remember in this sort of a culture, uh, your, your animals, they were part of your wealth. And so they were required to give seven rams and seven bulls. That was one of the things required of them. It cost them that. And it also cost them some humility. They had to go to Job, this man they had accused of doing some terrible thing. They had to go to him and ask him to pray for them. The redemption cost them something. They had not only sinned against God, but they had sinned against Job as well. So Job became, in a sense, the mediator, their advocate with God. We too have a mediator, Jesus, who made a sacrifice for our sins, that we might be made right with, with the Father, God, God has offered us a restored relationship with him, but he requires something on our part. He requires action on our part. He requires us to surrender, to say, okay, not my will, Lord, but yours. To surrender our priorities. God's grace is free, and yet it costs us everything. In Jesus, we find the invitation to follow him. But that invitation, it says, it says in the Gospels that, that that invitation to follow him includes this, pick up your cross daily and follow me. God's grace is free, and yet it requires us something. It requires us to respond to his offer of grace, to surrender our lives. Not my will, Lord, but yours. To ask Christ to have his way in your life is a very powerful prayer. Paul wrote about this kind of uh, surrender in 1 Thessalonians 5 when he says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. Job's friends are restored with both God and each other. But, but it required them to make a move, a sacrifice. An act of consecration was required of them. God made the offer, but they had to respond. With his trust in God restored, Job continues to live. We're left with this, this hopeful ending. God repaid Job for what he had lost, in a sense, with interest. Job acquired even more wealth than he had before. He was blessed with 10 more children. His friends and family and everyone he knew before this had all happened came bearing gifts, offering comfort, offering fellowship. Job's life had a second act. Can you imagine, Job, what it must have been like? He spent, he spent all this time. First, he spent time alone, basically sitting in dust and ashes with this incredibly heavy sorrow, being, being sick with sores all over his body. He has just three friends that come and sit with him. But before long, they just, they just become his accusers. In his, in his illness and in his sorrow, where was everybody else? 
He had to feel that separation from his community, from his from the life that he knew. And now, not only is his wealth restored, not only is he is he blessed with more children, but all those he knew before, they not only come to him, they not only surround him, they not only comfort him, but they even they even bring him gifts. It's almost as if they're repenting. He's once again stepping into life with all its beauty and all its struggle. Job's life had a second act and he lived to a ripe old age. Along with Job's renewed faith in God came great courage. Job had experienced incredibly great pain. Yet after everything he had been through, he was willing to move forward. Job had the courage to love again. God replaced Job's herds, replaced his wealth. It would be really wrong to say that God replaced Job's children. Job's children were irreplaceable. He loved them. They were human beings created in the image of God, unique in their identities. Job loved them. God couldn't replace what Job had lost when it came to his children. But God wasn't done blessing Job. And he blessed him with more children. Not a replacement, but more joy. Can you imagine the, the fear that Job would have had of being a father again? He knew how precarious life was, especially the life of his children, how fragile they were. Yet he had the courage to be a father again. Job had the courage to rebuild his life, to start over, to not give up, but to move forward, trusting that God was still at work in his life. Job had courage to trust his friends again. That must have taken some courage, not only to to forgive his friends, but to trust them again. When Job was sick, all but a few friends had seemed to abandon him. And the ones who didn't uh, wrongly accused him. Yet Job embraces life again. Job was offering hospitality and friendship again to those who had not supported him during his suffering. This whole ordeal changed Job. Job was a changed man. Wouldn't anybody be changed through this ordeal? Job was wiser. Job had seen God and heard his voice. He didn't understand why all these terrible things happened to him. But he had put his eyes on his Redeemer. God had revealed himself to Job in the storm. He had heard God's voice and he had put his trust in God. God heard Job's prayers and he answered him. There must have been times when Job felt like God had had abandoned him and yet he hadn't. God heard every conversation Job had with his friends. God heard every prayer Job Job had offered. Job was wealthier. At the end of this story, he had double the wealth that he had when it started. And you know what else? I think Job was more generous at the end of this story. At the beginning of the story, it talks about how You know, it implies that Job is this this righteous man that everybody respects. He was a good man. And yet I have to think that his generosity grew. Uh, Why would I say that? There's this little, amazing little detail that sticks out in this story. Think about Job's time and culture. The society he lived in. And consider this fact. In addition to his seven sons, Job had three daughters 
It actually mentions, it actually names them. It doesn't name any of Job's sons, but it names his daughters. Jemima, Keziah, and Karim Bahok. I know I'm pronouncing that one wrong, but they're specifically mentioned by name. And it specifically mentioned that these women were the, the most beautiful in the land. And when we think about that time and that place and that culture, and we think about what an inheritance meant. A father would pass on to his sons an inheritance so that they could keep their land and their wealth within their family. Daughters didn't usually receive an inheritance. Daughters would marry, and once they married, any wealth or land that they owned would become their husband's, and would be passed on to their husband's sons, leaving the family where it began. And so that, that wasn't something that was normally done. That was so when we see this detail that, that Job gave his daughters an inheritance along with his sons, Job gave them an inheritance that he knew would be passed down in their husband's family line. That detail says something about Job's love for his daughters and his generosity. I suspect Job had, had learned not to take the blessings of God for granted. I think Job understood that everything he had belonged to God and not him. As Job stated in chapter 1, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Life is fragile. Life is short. We have this finite amount of time in this world. And we must praise God for the joys he's given us and not take them for granted. For Job, he had lost everything, but God redeemed him and brought restoration to his life. He lived again. We too may find ourselves in need of restoration. At some point in our lives, we will recognize our helplessness in the storms of life that swirl around us. At some point, we will question why. We will question our place in this world. We will recognize our brokenness and our sinfulness. We will recognize the fragility of life. From time to time, we will all hit these moments of crisis. From time to time, when we think about life and who we are, and when we think of who God is, we will come to a place of humility. We recognize our need for God, our need for a Savior. The good news is for us, God has revealed that Savior to us. We know his name is Jesus. And we know that in Jesus we find hope. We know that in Jesus we find hope wholeness, completeness. We find restoration. Jesus forgives and Jesus changes hearts. In Jesus, we find the hope for a new life. The book of Job does teach us some things about suffering. Suffering is part of human existence in this broken, sinful world. We will all ex experience it at some point. We know that sin is one of the causes of suffering, but it's not the only one. Or I should say, we know that our personal choices, our personal sins, are not the only causes of our suffering. Sometimes they are, but not always. We know that like a parent, God sometimes disciplines his children. God sometimes allows suffering to test our faith. Sometimes our suffering is a result of other people's actions, intentional or not. Others cause us suffering. For Job, uh, these other people groups, the Chaldeans and the, the Sabians, they came and stole his herds. Job's friends brought accusations against him. They hurt him. And of course, we know something Job didn't. We saw at the beginning this scene in heaven where 
God and Satan are talking, we know that the accuser, Satan, came and accused Job. We know that Satan may cause some suffering, but he is under God's control. Job never received an answer to why he suffered, and often neither will we. Job also never learned why God blessed the rest of his life. That doesn't always happen. In fact, I don't think it usually happens. After Job's time of suffering, God really blessed the rest of his life abundantly. But he never knew why. It's as he said earlier, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. We don't always understand why things happen, but we know that God loved us enough to become flesh and blood and dwell among us. We know he loved us enough to lay down his life on the cross. We need not be either surprised or feel condemned by our suffering. Before Jesus was crucified, or before he was arrested and crucified, he told his disciples, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in you, so that in me you may have peace. And then Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to us, In this world you may have trouble, or in this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble, but we know that ultimately, the Lord will restore those who put their trust in him. With faith in Jesus, the Son of God, the Father, who is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, we can say as Job did in chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. In the midst of this storm-filled world, we have a Redeemer, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Whosoever puts their trust in him will not perish, but have eternal life. We have hope. We have a future. We have a Savior who has demonstrated his love, his love for us on the cross. Will you put your trust in him? He will be with you through good times and through bad times. He will lead you through the storms of life. He will hear your prayers. He offers us redemption and a place in his kingdom. As we conclude our, our look at Job, remember this. The world is full of beauty and wonder. And yet pain and suffering are part of life in this fallen world. But we have this hope. We have this hope that God so loved all of us, that he became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. He took on pain. He took on suffering. He experienced all the hardships of life in, the, in this world just as we do. In Jesus, in his sacrifice, we find the hope of redemption. We find the hope of resurrection. The Apostle Paul uh, wrote in Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. In Christ we have hope. We have a future. When you don't understand life in this world, keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Keep your heart focused on his love. The book of Job is just one part of this collection of scripture we call the Bible. But we've seen the end of the book. We've seen how it all ends. Job had confidence that in the end he would see his Redeemer with his own eyes. We know the name of our Redeemer is Jesus. 
that we can have a relationship with him now in this broken world. And that because of his sacrifice, we too will someday see him with our own eyes. Near the end of the Bible, in Revelation 21, our Redeemer speaks. He says, And I, and I heard a loud voice from, from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be uh, with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more pain, no more death or mourning or crying, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. Our Redeemer says, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy, and true. Trustworthy and true is how Job viewed his Redeemer. And in the end, that's, that's the ultimate question for us. Will we embrace the truth of who God is? Will we put our trust in him? It's one thing to put our trust in him today, Maybe today's going pretty well. But will it, can I continue to put all my trust in him tomorrow when things aren't going so well? Will I trust him? Will I continue this life and trust with him to walk step by step in relationship with him? That's it. I've, I've found myself, I think like anybody else, you know, Pastors don't have these magic words. We just have to trust God like everybody else. And I found myself different times over the years talking with somebody who knew they were dying. And the only real question for them, the only question they had to answer was simply this, do you trust Jesus? Because really there is no, there's no more to it than that. We don't have all the answers but we know who the Redeemer is. And, his, and the question is simply, will we trust him? We're gonna sing one last song as we close this morning. That's the question of the week. Do you trust him? And will you continue to trust him? Let's stand as we sing this last song.
may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. God bless you, and enjoy your afternoon.